How to make a fashion statement. Step one, take your favorite piece of clothing. Turn it inside out to show the label. Step three, take a picture. Step four, ask the brand and Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us here today. Um, it looks like we have a little bit of technical difficulties with the video earlier, but don't worry, you haven't missed much. We're just gonna jump straight into it. I hope everyone has been having a great Earth Week and a great Fashion Revolution Week, and that you've been tuning in so far. So just a quick introduction, Fashion Revolution Week is part of the wider Earth Day campaign by Think City in collaboration with Fashion Revolution and Friends at Bukit Kara. There are a whole suite of activities for us to be a part of restoring on our earth and we'd love for you to join in we're pushing this calendar into the chat box over there so you can look take a closer look at it and i hope i'll see you at the rest of our events Fashion revolution week happens every year in the week coinciding with 24th april the anniversary of the rana plaza disaster in bangladesh and each year we remember the lives lost and demand that no one should die for fashion and campaign for systemic change in the fashion industry now we've kicked off with a few panels already, uh, our fashion waste panel, our support local panel, and our resiliency of sustainable fashion panel where we explore the scale of our overconsumption and production and how our local fashion industry can shape a fair and responsible industry. This Fashion Revolution Week, we are partnering with Think City Institute, Global Shapers Kuala Lumpur, Raffles Institute, and respected voices across the fashion industry as we bring people together from across our community to amplify unheard and marginalized voices and work together to explore innovative and interconnected solutions. Now, as part of Think City Institute's Earth Week 2021 campaign, uh, you all also get a little gift at the end because all attendees will be receiving a 30% discount voucher for the Habitat Penang Hill made possible by the Habitat Penang Hill and Habitat Foundation. Now, let's keep this an interactive session. We have a really power-packed panel uh, for you here today. Um, the chat box is open for you to share your insights and thoughts and all the questions that you may have for the panel, I will try and get as much of them addressed as much of them addressed as we can. Excuse me. So um, we're just going to jump straight into it. Uh, we've got a great budget panel coming up for you. So without further further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator for today, Nick Faiz, Nick Amin, President of Malaysian Craft Council and founder of Gahara. The architect turned artist is a third, third generation body artist that aims to revive traditional batik production, embrace a more eco friendly, ethical, and sustainable approach to batik as he leads the Malaysian Craft Council, a non profit organization that advocates and accelerates the growth of Malaysian craft industry. Thank you so much, Nick, um, for being here with us, and I'll pass the stage to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Hello, everyone, and, and uh, Thank you to Fashion Revolution. Thanks to Think City for having me to be the moderator for today's session. Industry panel discussion, and, and we're going to talk about batik, thriving or merely surviving. But before I go into that, let me you know, briefly bring you through to the industry of batik and, 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 and uh, 200 years old of history in the land of Malaysia. And then where has it gone forward after two centuries? So I'm not going to talk alone about this. And, and uh, we have a few great panelists with us today, which is the first one. Let me introduce to you Amy Blair, founder of the Batik Boutique, an award-winning social enterprise empowering artisans of Malaysia. And her company is recognized as a regional model for pioneering business with triple bottom, that is people, profit, and planet. 
Hello, Amy. Hi, Nick. Hey, How are you today? Great. How are you guys? How are you? The second, I'm, I'm good. And the second panelist for today is the founder of Cotton and Saigo, Mariam. And, and Mariam has been uh, working on the forgotten butter makers and also preserving culture. And he is also the founder of Bijo Bazaar, the youth pop up culture of Guerrilla Pop up fashion and craft bazaar. Hi, Maria. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. And last but not least, the one and only founder and creative director of Fern. Let me introduce you, Fern Chua. Hi, Fern. Fern is a brand uh, of sustainable luxury resort wear and also artisanal collective from all around the globe to bring ethical bespoke lifestyle goods. We're going to go through that in a bit. But before that, let, let us start with this basic question of batik because you know we're looking into the the, the, the where batik is at the moment and and you guys in front of me has been in this industry for a long time but to start with let me ask Amy first Amy what what is batik let's start with the basic question okay and I know you will slap a lot of people's face here <laughs> okay so my friends and I on this panel, we often have this conversation together of what is batik. Um, so some people would say it's a motive. Um, it's a type of design. I think those of us on this panel would say, would take it to another level to say that batik is an art form of a textile design that uses a wax resistant. And so what we would do, especially on the artisan side and the, that it is handcrafted, and that it uses wax to resist with either blocking or chanting, which is like a little pen um, and has layering to it. And that the whole process of this type of fabric is batik. Um, other people outside of even in Malaysia and abroad would often refer to batik as just a print on a shirt. And that could be authentic handcrafted batik or it maybe is also just a machine printed designed, you know, of a motif batik. But I think what we would all subscribe to on this panel would be that the actual definition is that it is handcrafted using a wax resist method of dyeing an artisan made. Yeah. Yes. No, you see, uh, you are, I mean, let's face it, you are not Malaysian and then you are actually empowering this into the next level. And, and, and we have a lot of our locals who are still wearing batik that is not even pure. So, I mean, that actually justified the question of why is batik dying? So uh, that is actually not the only reason why we go through this question and then why we have this conversation. And then let's see, after a few years in this industry, let me ask Fern on this question. What, what is your take on batik industry in Malaysia? Current take? <laughs> Current take. Or maybe after how many years have you been in this industry? Oh my goodness. It's quite interesting, isn't it, Nick? Um, yeah, well, officially six years, but unofficially, what, coming up to 10 years now? Amazing. Yeah. And then how do you so, see the whole? Yeah. Yeah, how do I see the butter industry? I think, you know, back in the days, remember, Nick, when we first met to the time. Uh, at, the, at this point of time, I, I think, you know, we have actually grown quite a little bit in terms of visibility, in terms of where we are, in terms of what people know about Bate. You know, when when I first started off, it was almost like, oh, right. You know, it, it, it's, it's not even really, I mean, it's heard of, of course, but it was nothing as cool as how it should be nowadays. So, you know, we have definitely progressed a lot, but I wouldn't say it's a a remarkable progress. There's still a lot of work to be done and that's why we are all here. Yes. Oh yeah. And then uh, for, for Maria, we see that uh, there are a lot of uh, misconception about batik and then some people thought that batik is on the motif and some people thought that batik is actually something with colors or something with pattern on fabric. So uh, how do you justify that? And how do you say that, that, that Batik should be on their own uh, level, or, or how do uh, I mean we, we should treat them differently? 
Um, the why um, I'm attracted to Batik was um, the story behind um, uh, the story it carries, like um, how the uh, block um, block uh, is produced. It's like a process improvement of the uh, block in Indonesia, and how we print it, how we print Batik is also a process improvement. So it's like um, it's um, something that needs I mean needs to be sent out there that um, Malaysians are capable of uh, innovating as well. Um, they are uh, capable of uh, improving um, processes and all that. So that's why I'm attracted to Batik. Um, why we need, uh, that's the, re uh, the reason why we need to uh, retain the uh, craft is because of the story that it, um, it carries with it. So that's my stand. Okay, which means that Batik comes with history. And then I was yeah. talking about the two years, the two, 200 years of history of Batik in Malaysia. And then everybody knows that when we talk about Batik, Indonesia will pop up in our mind. And, and, and I think a lot of uh, people, or maybe some, some people knows that Indonesia has, a, has been acknowledged by UNESCO as the Arab Batik is a UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage of humanity listed in 2009. And also Batik of Indonesia has been internationally recognized as a historical fabric of human civilization. So how about Malaysia? Let me give it to Fern first. <laughs> I don't know the answer. You don't know the answer. No. But then Indonesia applied for it. So um, that's the only reason, I mean, it went through because they applied for it. But um, Bati has been around, like um, it was, um, it came to Malaysia from Indonesia and then it was yes. in, Indo um, in India before that. And then China also um, practiced the same, uh, what they call it, technique. So it's been around. Um, it uh, it got uh, dimashurkan, I think, um, in yeah. Indonesia by the Dutch. Hence, um, it's well known. But it's a technique that has been practiced all around, I think. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. can I add to this? Like, I think, uh, Mariam, you have a point there. And I believe that that's pretty much the truth in that sense that I think there's a lot more for Indonesian batik, they had this more, I mean, it, it's part of their culture for the longest time. They have, I mean, I can't deny the fact that, you know, in history wise, like they have a longer span in terms of like, um, in uh, of batik being introduced to them. And obviously there was a lot of things in between and how, you know, it has influenced the Malaysian, I mean, how it has been brought over to this country as well. So, you know, yes, in some sense that, you know, a part of it, I believe that it comes from Indonesia, but you know, the fact that they have gained that doesn't mean that what we have is not right or like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not valid. I think there's so much more to it that we can talk about, you know, and how it has really evolved. And um, and it's still a beautiful technique at the end of the day mm -hmm. that has been yeah. spread well across around the world. It's not just, you know, on Indonesia side that, you know, but I believe that we have a place to earn for it as well. Yeah. Which means that I, I believe that all three panelists agreed with me that when we say, when we talk about Batik, let's not put a limit of borders. Yeah. Batik is for the world, except that the, the, the word Batik is actually from Indonesia. So we cannot yeah. deny that. But of course, yeah. a lot of other continents and states and countries has Batik of their own. So, yeah. Amy, you uh, of, 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 uh, your business, the Batik Boutique, has been uh, recognizing and, 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 and applying or practicing the traditional method of Batik that is used. And, and you see that now Batik is now fading away because it's, can I say that the word commoditized? And then people are trying to commercialize that as much as they can. But the Batik Boutique took a step forward on, on holding up to the original Batik production, not uh, compromising on the prints and everything and then why do you do that there must be some 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 speciality that you see in that yeah so um my background was actually tourism when i moved to malaysia i was working in tourism so my initial contact with Bati was a tourism perspective. and actually i was thinking how could we make a gift for souvenir that people 
people would want to buy that was authentic and actually middle aged and then they came to visit. So then yeah. um, fast forward, I met women living in people are flats who lost their money and that they were mothers and I was a mother living mother at the time. And then I went out to these villages to try to learn and understand what is this thing called what is this? So I was walking those trekking around and kind of merging together this whole picture that for me was this beautiful representation of Malaysian culture and coming from the tourism perspective I was thinking wow this is like this hidden gem that Malaysians should be like so proud of right as their own but also that the rest of the world should get to see when they come here and so that's kind of how we put together Boutique so from the very beginning it was set up as a charity at the beginning to figure out how to employ people sustainably how to keep the tradition going on and oh, how- Oh, Amy, I cannot hear you. Uh, oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Better? Maybe the other panelists yeah. can hear, or is it just me? I, I cannot hear you. Um, You're better now. Um, you're sorry. Now. I, I'm just popping in here. Mariam, could you please turn off your mic when you're not speaking? Because I think it's overshadowing uh, and, and thank you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Better. Okay. Yeah. So I, I merged together these ideas of how do you help people? How do you highlight what is authentic from a location? And how do you make it something that everyone can appreciate that benefits everyone involved? Um, so for me, that's kind of the background I've come from. And I do think that um, we have to monetize this We because if you want Malaysian batik to be preserved and to thrive, well, people need to see it as a sustainable business. They need to see that it's an option. Right. So what my, my focus is, is how do we highlight what it is both for Malaysia, but globally so that people in Malaysia can appreciate it and then also want to be part of it to keep it going and be sustained. Um, so that's what my business focus is. On. Great, great. Yeah. And then uh, from from what I can see that the Batik Boutique is actually focusing on merchandising that is uh, that has not been the norm in the previous time. And, and you have been introducing of a lot of uh, accessories line and then try to tackle into the other market, which I think is interesting because when, when we have somebody like you who see from a different perspective as us, as the local who are actually focusing on the, um, focusing on the, on the process and, and you have brought it into another level. But how 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 have you perceived that till now? Do 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 you focusing on the market locally or do you focus on the market internationally? Yeah, good question. Um, it's funny. I still get comments sometimes from local Malaysians who will say to me like, "Oh, rugila, like ora masaleh kan buat macam ni," and I'm like, "Okay." So I think we have to get over that first of all, and and actually maybe see it as a that's why I asked that question. <laughs> maybe see it as a compliment that actually from the outside I value something that's yours, right? And like to see how to make it uh, appreciated by other people as well. Um, yeah. So I see it differently because I didn't have the same. Just like if you came to Texas, where I'm from, you might see something that's in my background and culture differently than I see it because you don't have the same worldview of upbringing that I do, right? So yep. I didn't ever see, like, it, Batik to me is so limitless because I didn't come from years and, you know, generations of people who saw it a certain way. So at first, my friends would laugh at me, like, why do you want to make this a placemat, like homeware? Like, we wear that like sarong when we like, you know, mandi and like bathe and stuff. And I'm like, oh, really? Because actually, I think it'd be nice, you know, on the table. So it's been a journey. And along the way, I've taken a lot of feedback, um, positive and negative, um, all along the way. But I think what we do now from COVID last year, we were very focused on corporate gifting and on um, one retail outlet and small kind of collections. But that flipped everything upside down for us because our production was shut down, the boutiques were shut down, no corporates were ordering. So how? You know, I've got, I've got, um, you know, a hundred people I need to keep employed at some level, you know, 20 on my payroll. So like, what do you do when, you know, I don't have the same resources that other big businesses would have to keep that going. So, um, we pivoted and we've pushed a lot to trying to get, so right now I would say about 70% of our market is still in Malaysia, but we're expanding both on e-commerce and in our um, in our corporate gifting and all still globally. Um, last, yeah. last year, we shipped to 38 countries um, in, in 20, 
2020, which is pretty impressive, like to grow our e-commerce to 38 countries. And this wow. year we're trying to expand to still set a precedent here in Malaysia because it's our flagship and you know where we want, but also really realizing the need to diversify because of like pandemic, what happens when an economy goes down in one country? If you're only in that country, you're not gonna make it necessarily, right? So um, so that's my, my focus right now is in expanding us globally so that we can sustain these harder times whenever they come and actually be long lasting um, on behalf of Malaysian Batik. Yeah. Okay, so there are two things here because uh, when we talk about this Batik, whether it's thriving or merely surviving, it has been happening since before pandemic. And then now with the pandemic hit, hitting all around the world, we see this is like a double layer of challenges that we have to go through. And then Fern, you are actually uh, promoting a very contemporized and, and, and more of the luxury side of products or merchandises and, and, and resort. So when we talk resort, we talk about tourists. And, and we have this thing happening, hitting all around the world. And then we have like zero tourists coming into Malaysia at the moment. And this is actually on the second year of the thing happen. So, um, yeah, I, I would like to as much as ask you about the business, the, the experience of yours in your business. But maybe we look at a bigger school, bigger scope. How do you how do you address that challenge and how do you face that? Um... I think what's interesting is that I, I, I realized that, you know, what's important is growing within the country is important. Getting visibility on the local market is more important. Uh, making people understand what we're doing is more important than trying to educate people out of the country. Um, so for me, it was a lot more about trying to accommodate to what the local needs. Um, for me, it's a lot about, you know, how do you incorporate wares that, um, that are suitable, not just for tourists, but you know, in general, people who wants to wear comfortable pieces and walk out the street every day. And, you know, and knowing the fact that it's unique, it's something different, um, that's what I aim for. I mean, being a resort wear brand doesn't mean that I will be like really fo fully, fo fully focusing on tourism. And also at the same time, like, you know, being, um, a country where we are filled with so many different ethnicities i think you know it's a, a brilliant place to start with you know it, being able to accommodate for different festive occasions is something that i i feel proud of doing um to be very honest with you you know but it has been long related with traditional malay wear but also how we actually able to also um expand expand into uh, different segments into like, you know, Chinese New York um, wear and also at the same time, like, you know, I'll, I'll slowly work towards Deepa Valley for sure. But I think, you know, those are the main uh, races that we're trying to focus on Christmas and different festive occasions. So I, I and also at the same time, like I think a lot of um, big fashion brands, they are focusing so much on like, OK, on certain occasions, how many collections we need to actually have and how many you know, uh, we have to follow the fashion calendar per se. But for me, it's all about like, you know, trying to go according to what the local needs and what, what's very interesting as well. I think the even the international markets trying to pick up as well. They don't mind the fact that, you know, it's like, hey, you know, it's not a part of the fashion calendar that I'm chasing after. Um, those are the people that I realized that, you know, this, it's, it's interesting, like, you know, as I'm growing the brand as well, this is important for us to learn as well along the way. So um, tourists or not, I think that's just a, a, a part of puzzle. They are definitely for me, you know, it, it's a, a, a brownie point. But what I like to focus on is actually growing the market within our own local scene. Yes, okay. first. Yeah. That's a very good move. Maybe you have forecasted pandemic what happened six years ago. <laughs> no. yeah, but I think, yeah. yeah but i think my brand has always been very uh, focused on local brand like local market to begin with you know and mm -hmm. um that has always been the key but the, the point is actually obviously i would like to expand the the my my like my collection or and also to be able to actually um expand the brand to other countries but i'm taking it one step at a time yeah. Okay, so, um, wow, that's, that's actually a very interesting answer. And um, 
of all these points, I'm sure that uh, everybody realized here that uh, all three panels are actually from the group that is on the younger generation. And, and budget has been monopolized as far as what Fern said by local Malay. And, um, you know, it has been inherited from families. And, and uh, most of the uh, purveyors of batik has been in their, in their uh, golden ages. So, Maria, you have introduced this Bijou Bazaar, and I'm sure that you have been dealing with a lot of youngsters who are entering mm -hmm. into the market. And then let's focus on batik. And I'm sure you have a lot of other crafts associated with that bazaar. But mm -hmm. what we can see here, um, the, the perception, the approach, and the treatment of Batik industry among young generation has been different, like what Fern has been what, what Fern has mm -hmm. mentioned before. So, what what uh, how do you see or, or how do you observe that? And um, will that be uh, innovating our Batik industry and, and probably um, answering the question mm -hmm. of whether it's thri thriving or really surviving? Okay, um, to me right now um, in the uh, market that I'm serving. I see that batik is in trend. The trend started in 2016, and normally a trend would uh, last 10 years. So um, brands have started picking up uh, batik and in, um, including them into their design. So what we do, uh, we we actually do a lot of B2B. We uh, supply batik to brands uh, for their collections. So we've been focusing on that. Um, the challenge is here uh, before the trend ends in the next uh, in this 10 year period the uh, batik should be in the mainstream otherwise it will die with the trend so that's yeah that's the challenge i feel with let's my let's make it as let's make it a point it's here to stay forever <laughs> yeah so, uh, we work together to make um to make it you know, bigger than the what it is now before the yeah. trend dies out. Yeah, so that's what I feel. Well, when 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 you talk about trend, uh, maybe I can share a little bit of what I know or have been informed by people. Um, you were mentioning 2016. Okay, which means that but it has been in the fall of in the year before that, and and uh, it has been on a peak somewhere in 2005 to 2008 um, and that was actually uh, when uh, during the time where uh, that industry and Dun has tried to, to you know to champion batik and then try to bring it to a different level and before that somewhere near to 98 99 batik is actually dead was dead and uh, in 1995 batik was on a peak so we see here that uh, it was actually even in 85, and then after that it gone down, and then it rised again, and then uh, it gone down. So when, when we look at the trend, now we are in 2021, where it was actually probably in, in the, uh, not in a good shape, somewhere um, 2019, 2018, and then now it's coming up again. So we probably, if you look at the trend, that we are coming into 2025, where Batik will be on a peak again. Yeah. So having said that, we we uh, because when we look at the trend, then definitely government has been supporting a lot about this initiative. But if you ask me, then we uh, actually we uh, go probably government is a bit tired of, of helping out too much of our people, and 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 uh, we talk about the makers and the you know purveyors of batik. Uh, in the rural area, they are always looking up for supports from the government, which I think is not a healthy way. We have to give a fishing rod instead of fish. Yeah, by we, so, I mean the players. Well, by me, but yeah. I, yeah, I mean the players as uh, people in the industry. We need to uh, uh, push it out. Yeah. Yeah, and then I see that you 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 are actually working a lot with the makers of batik in the rural area, I believe then how do you justify to them that um, is it just by, you know, when there is a demand, there will be a supply. But how do you motivate them in, in, in continuing uh, producing batik for you? Okay, I first met the batik makers in 2014. Uh, so back then, um, some of them wanted to close their workshops. 
um, I decided to um, work with them, uh, I mean, buy their products and show that they can sell their batik better so that they can, they can pay their workers better. Because back then they had workers issue. So um, I've been doing that for two years and then um, they started um, agreeing with me that they can put up the price. So they started putting up the price. Um, so it, it's, it's a process. Like um, um, in 2018, I actually uh, secured a supply to a brand who's retailing the bate in uh, Netapote. Um, but um, you know, working with um, high um, uh, premium brands, they want um, uh, good quality. Uh, you have to meet uh, the colors and all. So um, we've given the bate makers the experience, and now they're telling me. Uh, they appreciate their uh, stresslessness better because you know uh, needing to meet the uh, colors and all that they find stressful. So it's it's not just um, opening up the market; it's also uh, changing the makers as well. There's a lot of um, I mean they are not 100% uh, on board as well. They want they want to uh, sustain the way things are. They, they don't really want to change yeah. that much, but it's at the same time, change. change is happening. It takes time, though. Yeah. So I agree with you because when there is a change that we need to introduce, they have been doing this for the past 40, 30, 40 years. So uh, it's hard for Mariam. And I'm sure it's not yeah. easy for Amy. As well. No. <laughs> so, Amy, share it with us. Yeah. Can you hear me before I talk yes. more? Okay. So we find it's very challenging because fashion in general and e-commerce or product, whatever you're talking about, selling retail, I mean, any of these things, the B2B market um, is very challenging because it's fast paced, right? And it's and actually what we're all doing in Latif is slow fashion, it's ethical fashion, it's sustainable fashion, these words that go around. So when you want to scale and grow, let me hold on. Mariam, can I get you to switch off your mic? Okay. Amy. Yeah. When when you want to scale and grow, but your supply chain is in a village, you know, in Kelantan, and they're yeah. happy with their like life uh, at a level, you know, then it's like, so how, uh, you know? Um, so we have to introduce. I think as a business, we have to introduce uh, like potential solutions for that so one thing we do is identify which artisans want to scale with us and have capacity maybe not today but are open to growing and we try to work with them more and we try to take our profit and help them you know we just we just refurbished a guy's roof on his workshop with our profit from by tpt and i'm proud of that because he was always complaining in typhoon end of the year all this stuff and you're like oh my god but i have big order you know um so we fixed his yes. roof because that was what he said was keeping him from doing it so like we see how if that's really what's keeping him from doing it or not yeah so we need to upgrade we need to have conversation with the artists we need to merge it's like we're in between these worlds where i understand my client i understand the market right i understand e-commerce these things i'm also learning but I also understand the artist. I understand their mindset, right? So you have to learn how to merge those two together to help them. Their worlds are so apart. So if you want to scale, you need to help them. You know, it's a bit like, okay, you take one step and you take one step, you know, and then I take like 10 steps, you know, <laughs> and then you take one step and you take one step. So um, it's, a, it's yeah. a bit of like, uh, it's very relational. Batik is a very relational art form and, and industry. And it's important to bring people alongside. And honestly, you can, as a brand, you can only go as fast and as far as the people who are with you want to go. So you need to know that, I think. Yeah. Is that the reason why you speak Malay? Or you, you learn how to speak Malay? Uh, I was learning as a hobby years ago um, because I of just... See. But now I know it's why I didn't, you know, one of those things that you, you happens and you're kind of like, why this? And you don't really know. And then later you're like, oh, that's why. So obviously yeah. now, yeah, yeah. I mean, I work with people in villages. I work with women in the PPR flats. Like uh, we speak Bahasa whenever we communicate about orders. And I think you couldn't do what I'm doing 
if you don't speak Bahasa. You couldn't do it very well. You just, I already miss things anyway, right? Culturally. And I mean, I've lived yeah. here almost 15 years and I still miss stuff. You know, innocently, I just kind of like miss a meaning of like the layer meaning behind something. But uh, yeah, yeah, if I don't speak Bahasa, then how can Allah? Exactly. And then uh, 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 we have a question here that uh, probably has a bit, uh, has somehow uh, related to what I asked before. And um, let's jump into a point that I still want to ask question before we opened up into the Q&A. Uh, Mariam was mentioning about the pricing point before. And then uh, you said that when, when, we, uh, when we, put, we put up a price at the level where the artisans are comfortable with, then we can get to have it more, more makers to create the batik. But we have always been having this issue that batik is expensive. People are, keep on asking, why is butter expensive? And, and, and um, yeah, are you guys making a lot of money? Third, <laughs> <laughs> because you are doing a luxury fashion line. And uh, we when okay, when, uh, through that, in my own perspective, we see that butter is actually a product. Whereas when we talk about Chanel handbag, it's not a product. So I'm sure you have some points of your own when you put up a firm merchandising of fern at the level of a, a, a luxury resort wear. Mm -hmm. Tell me well, it. you see, the thing is that there's actually a lot of things that goes behind the scenes that a lot of people are not aware of. Um, how much of time has been spent in developing the collection? Um, I'll just be honest, like, I think if you were to think about being in the fashion industry, mm -hmm. it takes you six months, but for us, it takes a longer time. But of course, it gets shorter because, you know, we learn the technique, we, we learn how to move in a faster pace, but I can't deny, like I have my team working end to end, figuring out every single measurement for every single piece of the design in matters because how the pattern falls on a certain placement, it makes sense in that sense that, you know, how it actually makes a person feel when they put on my piece. So a lot of justification goes behind that that nobody actually understood. They think that, oh, let me just draw this thing. No, it doesn't work that way. For me, yeah. it comes down to like, oh, I figure out this pattern. How do I apply to this particular silhouette? And how, where do I apply to it? What sort of detailings do we put into? How many samples do we come up with in order just to actually finalize that beautiful piece of garment? You know, a lot of other details that nobody talks about, and that's my reality. And so that's just one part of it that when it comes to the design part, how much time and effort we put into it. And now, from my understanding, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, um, you know, whatsoever, but for me, it matters also at the same time that I'm able to pay my staff well. I would like to think that I'm actually paying almost ab above average of what actually a lot of people are expecting. And that's the reason why, because I would like to, to continue to, to let the butter industry to thrive. I don't mind to, as long as people are actually able to, um, they, they see the effort that I'm trying to put in. And also at the same time, like, you know, providing work to the artisans when they ask for a certain price point. And I try to fulfill like whatever I can, obviously, you know, we're in business, obviously we want to try to keep our, our cost as low as possible but we have to be honest with each other as well like you know every cent matters like you know when we think about it the my rental my cost of like you know sending the goods and also yeah. the materials the materials and let's just talk about that as well like you know we are choosing because of batik nature we have to use natural materials there's no there's no shortcut in that sense that to create a beautiful piece you need beautiful fabrics to create them and that is actually double or triple the price because they're all silk or cotton. And I put in the extra effort. I work with Japanese artisan uh, suppliers of mine to actually produce uh, or, uh, organic cotton for me. So like things like that, you know, these are the extra bits that I've done to actually make my brand a little bit more luxurious, I would say. And these are the things that I want to be able to provide for other people and that's the point that actually how do i push my brand forward as well so there's a lot of different points like everyone has their own ways of looking at things and for me it's a lot about that as well like it's a whole big picture that we're talking about why why is my cost so high and why is my price of 
how do I justify the service when you come to my shop? The level of services do I provide and things like that. So I, I try my very, very best in terms of like trying to package this whole entire image of what we stand for. So there you go. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm telling you. And if anything, do let me know, like, you know, if you have any points you'd like to ask or anything. Yeah. Okay, so that answers question by Siti Nur Hazwani about the pricing point. And and uh, of course, I, I I have to agree with Fern because I myself has been in this industry for a long time. And um, we have to, again, what has been mentioned by Mariam before, that we have to give a room where profit can be shared. And then we can actually come to a point where we are comfortable in producing and, 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 and handling our business at at a more peaceful rate or, or at, at a point where we can actually try to work things out. You know, business is not easy. And then talking about this business where we deal a lot with human, as what Amy Blair was mentioning, is not easy. But there comes to another question or another challenge of Malaysian batik, where the raw material, is it from local or is it imported? No. Mariam, tell me about it. Um, well, we don't produce cotton or fabric, so definitely the fabrics are imported and they are, um, we have tax on top of them. Mm -hmm. We pay tax. Um, so it'll be, um, we are, I mean, it'll be costlier than what the Indonesians are, uh, uh, the, the cost in Indonesia. And at the same time, Malaysian market, we move to using what they call it, um, uh, safer dye, Ramazol rather than Aptol which is more expensive so that uh, comes into the cost as well so yeah where is that uh, material came from the material you mean that okay uh, uh, let's put into the percentage how many percent of raw material of uh, batik is imported and how many percent is low made? 100 percent oh wow really but that's the fact. Though. I, I just, I just fake to be sure. Don't, don't pretend, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> but no, I'm speaking on behalf of the viewers of the audience. They don't know that. But let's face it, guys. Hundred percent imported. Yes. Wow. We have no natural resources producing here, like for fabric wise. Okay. Yeah. I think okay. this. Amy is also uh, saying, not not this Amy. That Amy on the chat is saying you can't compete with labor cost as well. It's one is materials, but I think what people don't understand about Mati is if you run a fabric that's cheaper than what we all have to work with, and you run it through a machine, it's just ink and it's a machine cost. But that can be, you know, so that cost actually. It's, Sorry, no, Amy, Amy, we can't hear you. I think, Mariam, you need to turn down your. Mariam, can you mute? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. I think when you understand that if you run a piece of fabric through a machine and just print on it, that's already a cheaper fabric textile to begin with, you know, then it costs less. But, you know, when you work here in Malaysia and you you paint on it, like everybody has to get paid. I mean, it's what Fern was saying. Everybody who painted any of her pieces, who waxed it, who processed it, who dyed it, who cut it, who sewed it, they all get paid. And she wants to pay them fairly, right? And you add on the fact that everyone knows that the cost of living in Malaysia is more expensive than the cost of living in Indonesia the cost of living in India and in Bangladesh and other places that we're competing with in terms of production. So we, we as makers are required to pay people a certain rate, right? So when you add all of that up, the, the fabric, you know, that it's imported, that then we pay people to, you know, paint on it. It's a skill, it's an art that you're wearing and you put it all together, then someone sews it and all of those five to 10 hands need to be paid fairly. You, you actually, and then as a business, you have your own overheads, right? You actually are required to sell it at a certain rate or it's not fair for anyone. And I think as in the Malaysian market, we don't, maybe because we've had batik around so long, we don't appreciate and understand what it is really. And so it's a, right. it is art, you know, it is, it is people, it is textile, natural, you know, natural fibers and all. So what I think we're all trying to do, and maybe as our role as makers and companies selling batik, we need to keep educating 
everybody, which I think we're all doing a good job in. I mean, those of us here, it's probably why we're on this panel. But um, part of our role is is to create and is to design and is to produce, yeah. but it's also to educate. Yeah. yeah. And maybe and, yeah. and maybe that's like we don't want to all the time because we're like, oh, I got like five jobs already, you know. But if we really want Batik, Malaysian Batik to carry on and to be successful, mm -hmm. we need to keep educating the market on what and why and share that it is not that it's just oh my heart you know it's actually like there's a real reason behind it okay well um very good point amy and uh i know there's a question from karen that uh is asking about uh, water but let me go into this point uh this question first uh from zainaria johari well uh it mentioned about the topic of challenge the topic is about challenges in preserving cultural heritage and then identity in this case of Batik, in this case of Batik. But the question is, what would you say is the identity of Malaysian Batik? Okay, this is very interesting. A lot of people ask me this question as well, where Indonesian Batik has been very distinctive. Let's face it, it's a 2,000 years of history in there. And Malaysia has about 200 years. But what do we take about this right now? I know that technology comes in, 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 in package and then we can actually uh, speed up on, on certain angles. So um, I think Fern knows how to tackle <laughs> this question. Um, okay, so when it comes to this, I think, you know, we can't, we, we can't argue the fact that what Indonesia has in terms of like patterns and symbols and meanings and, you know, to a certain motives and things like that. So, you know, we can't compete with that. That's the truth. But that's the beauty about what we are able to do as well as Malaysians. We are free. We are we have so much freedom into creations of what we are what, what we are able to. And and that's the beauty of it. And that's why I'm thriving in this industry at this point of time, like because I'm able to voice my or express myself based on my inspiration. And that's what one thing I learned um, from a lot of peers of uh, batik makers in Indonesia as well. Like, you know, when we talk to them, they, they, are, and they said that, you know, where we are, they are used to doing that and trying to introduce new prints might be a little bit scary for them. And, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that's why when they actually try to introduce new modern, uh, the only ones who would buy would be Malaysians and not the Indonesians. So, there's a lot of different factors that comes into play when it comes to this, you know, and there's there's so much beauty of it that we can actually absorb out of this. Like, for me, uh, we need to move with time as well, you know, as much as I appreciate traditional motives. And I have to also be realistic about, like, you know, what sells at the end, you know, on the commercial front. And also at the same, the commercial value is important and how much of effort is being put into it. Imagine, like, uh, the amount of work I'm putting into creating a, a batik titik sort of, you know, that spends months on it. Like, how do I justify to actually sell for a piece of dress with that price? It's almost impossible. Right. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we have to try to move on with times also. And the beauty of what we are able to do with the block print and also at the same time, but I think you just have to be a little bit clever with the techniques. How do you actually invent what you want to do? And and for me, it's to tell stories through my creations, to my inspiration. So, yeah, that's that's what I think would be that's the that's my take on it. Anyway, yes. Okay, and then uh, okay, uh, looking at this uh, question, Malaysian prefer Indonesian but it more than local products. That must be something behind the scenario, Amy. How about American? Do they love Malaysian batik or do they love Indonesian batik? Um, unfortunately, they still don't even know what is batik. So I'm working on that part too. <laughs> um, okay, so okay. now I'm coming back to the yeah. local, local market. No, Why do local, you prefer Indonesian? I, I actually think it's the design. You know, I think a lot of what people are attracted to of Indonesian batik is what we would say is machine printed. I think they like the color, the design, the, you know, the, the intricacy. It's a, it looks very, it's layered and like intricate designs and colorings are more muted or whatever. So I think in terms of just style and design, they like that. But often what we know is often that is not even an actual batik, right? It's, 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 it's mass production because yeah. there is a need, there is an interest in the market. So there's a demand in the market and Indonesians have found a way to meet the demand and Malaysians are buying into that as well. Um, so that's the issue that I think we all have, but it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's the, the intricate designs and Malaysian batik in general, if you're stereotyping, um, if you go to like, you know, it's either, um, abstract or very like few designs or 
blocked very, you know, full and consistently. So I think we've not as makers, as the, as the artisans like tapped into really figuring out how to make a design. Um, and some of it is if you do chunting that it's not mass, it's not scalable, right? Because people don't mind to make two meters for your shirt. If it's one, you know, hand drawn, very intricate design. But if you now want to sell 25 of those shirts, no batik maker wants to chunting, you know, 50 pieces of that, you know what I mean? For your shirt. So there's the, the issues we have um, with the simplicity of the designs. And I think people are attracted to Indonesian's complexity of it. That's my opinion. I don't know what you guys think, but that's what I think. Maybe uh, Mariam, you have something to say about that? Um, I think um, adding on, um, Malaysians are not exposed to um, our prints as well. Uh, at least the um, the market um, the market that I'm used to, they don't know how Malaysian prints look like. As in, uh, yeah, when I tell them. Um, like I work with Wan Azhar, um, they are from the uh, family who does, um, I mean, the grandfather was the first batik maker in Trungganu or something, uh, Haji Ali. So um, when I work with uh, with them, I showed them the prints and all, um, they were not familiar with it. So they learned, as I learned, my audience learns with me as well. So they don't know how batik, uh, Malaysian batik looks like, basically. Yeah. Um, it's not, well, they are not exposed to it. Yeah. Well, I guess this issue happens not only in the industry. Whereas when we, when we look at, uh, coming back to, to, to the question by, by uh, Zainaria before, when, when they say that what, what do we do to make our Malaysian batik become distinctive in terms of design? Let's look into the song cat of ours, or maybe limar, limar fabric of ours. We have our very own motif, probably from spices, that we have not been digging it out. So maybe these are the things that we can have probably a platform to share with a lot of other artisans out there that in, in designing something to be distinctively Malaysian, there are some points that we can refer to. Yeah, probably in terms of the heritage, but uh, <clears throat> when we talk about history, maybe it's a little bit too deep for some people, whereas uh, they are just like trying to create something that is more like maybe abstract is interesting. So... Um, they go for abstract and then with that abstract then it goes nowhere but when we look at that perspective of design look at what andy warhol is doing so um, i mean probably these are the things that we should not put at, at level of perspective or, or maybe uh, a, a one viewpoint we can just like you know celebrate the differences and, and and varieties of ideas but of course it comes with time we cannot compete indonesia forever but what can we do is try to strive on our own and then try to keep it moving, try to keep our industry alive. So um, now we can go into the question of Karen when they ask about the creation of batik traditionally uses a lot of water. If we were to apply digital batik prints, wow, will it be considered less authentic? Who wants to answer this great <laughs> question? Fern? Oh God, you give me the hardest questions. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I think, I think you know, honestly, when it comes to this, uh, I'm not gonna lie that there's a, you know, usage of water, but you just have to be smart about it. I think there's a lot of all these different things that we can apply to it, um, you know, and also at the same time, when it comes to this, it's like, it's a chicken and egg thing. You definitely need water. Like for every everything that is being produced, I think there's a water consumption being used there. And and this it's no denial fact that you know but it needs water, and you know it's part of the process. But what's important is as as what I can see moving forward as well is that how do we recycle the water is being used and things like that. So you. For me, we try our very best in terms of how do we actually, you know, every cycle that washes it and, you know, how much water we use and we, we try to conserve whatever we can. Um, and that's basically what we are trying to do with every other, you know, how we produce our batik, basically. Um, and hopefully moving forward, you know, I think um, there's... Um, we would like to also invest if we have a bigger budget in terms of like you know production later on uh to be able to actually recycle the water uses or you know if there's any other 
ways we can try to implement, definitely we will definitely look into it. But as of now, because our quantity is still rather small, so you know it's not really a big of well big effect um effect out of this whole entire uh, point. But if you are talking about like if I'm producing more than a thousand meters per per day, then yeah, I would understand that. But literally now we are producing less than one tenth of it, or even yeah. So yeah, so that's my take basically how I'm seeing it. Yeah. Anybody wants to add to that point? Uh, okay, I, I have to add on that point. <laughs> um, thank you for the great question, uh, for, for, for the great explanation. But maybe somebody can answer me. When we talk about the industry that pollutes the Mother Earth, <clears throat> where does fashion uh, stands in? I think it's number two. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the creation of garments is not, is not, uh, it's not savvy after all. And then, of course, we talk about the uh, environmental issues and then how do we overcome that? And then Ferd mentioned about the need to, to, to treat wastewater or, or we call it a wastewater management system. So, um, yeah, certainly these are the things that we have to address and then we have to look through. And I think we have to, uh, to come to the last question before we wrap up because it's coming to four o'clock right now. Um, the question where uh, Isa Rahman has, or has, has raised up, most of the batik industries did not offer after-sales service. If it is so, why do after-sales service is seen as something that is less important to be applied in batik business? Fern, you were mentioning about uh, the, the package that you offered, like the services that you offered to your people while offering the price that you put in. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that you, you, you don't really agree with this uh, suggestion, but uh, talking about the general term of all batik makers or all batik businesses in Malaysia, do they provide after-sales service? And if they don't, why do you think so? It depends on what kind of after-sales service they're looking into. But for me, for example, like because I, I believe in um, custom orders, I think that's the beauty about batik that I can actually do because based on my designs, I'm able to offer different colors and patterns. I have my team to be able to actually create that. And you know that's the beauty of it, and and it, it's it's undeniable. I think for for me, when it comes to batik, we think about cloth. It relates to fashion and fashion, and that means that you know people always have their own different take on it and different tastes or different you know their needs. You know, so what we are able to do is to actually able to offer that sort of services for them. Um, most of the time, and that's why, you know, when it comes to like our price points, you know, we actually try to offer as much as possible, if anything, defects or, you know, whatever we can help to fix, if we can actually shorten, if we try to make them look any better, we would do our very, very best. And, you know, with um, either a small minimal fee or we don't charge at all, depending on what are the, you know, the sort of products that we're selling. So those are the things that we can try mm -hmm. to actually accommodate when it comes to, and obviously like, you know, coming to our shop, the whole personal service is very important. So I pay, I pay a lot of attention to that, um, you know, recognizing like what a customer wants is, is important at the end of the day. So um, I, I don't know about other people, but that's, you know, that's how I look at it because um, every piece matters for me, especially, you know, what puts a smile on their face, That that's what it matters. So sometimes I have people coming to me, not just because they want batik, but because they like my clothing as how comfortable they are, how beautiful they are. So there's a lot of different parts of it that, you know, component that I believe in a, in a business, you know, has to actually try to provide in terms of like, if you want to excel in the business, I'm not saying I'm the best, but what I'm saying is that you need to try your very level best to do that sort of customer service. And that's what I'm offering. Mm -hmm. Yes. Certainly. Well, when we talk about batik industry, uh, I like to make a point. I, I like to highlight uh, what I saw here uh, by Oniata Fandi. Oh, yes. I think we right. stop seeing the batik industry in particular with Indonesia as a competition. We are part of larger Nusantara and this is something we can be very proud of. So, um, well, uh, I, I, I have a little bit of background in business and then normally when we do business, we have to benchmark. And when we look into benchmarking, Probably this is not the thing that always Malaysia has to look up into Indonesia. 
we have to also see what uh, how's the growth of of uh, lace uh, in Italy and in France and and how where are they right now whether they are in the, actually in the mass market where whether they are actually in a lower price point and we have also tried to see the thistle and where are they now and how Japanese treat their handmade products are they putting it into a lower price point so this is the thing that we have to see and we talk about sustainable fashion and we, we talk about slow fashion movement so um, when when we are trying to uh, position our business or our industry into something that we probably see is uh, beneficial to the bigger market segment but indirectly is actually killing the makers themselves so that's probably what we call a sweatshop so whether we want to have that to happen so whether uh, that can actually be considered as thriving or is actually dying so yeah. i guess um that will probably conclude best of what um, our discussion today is about. So um, thank you very much to all the panelists. And I think I will pass back the mic to Melissa from Fashion Revolution. Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, that was a wonderful discussion. I really loved all the insights that everyone in the audience has shared in the chat as well. Um, there, you know, you've really gave us such a good conversation and it was very insightful. So thank you once again to all our panelists for spending time with us, for being so generous with your knowledge and for carrying the pride of Batik so well in Malaysia. It gives us a lot of hope uh, for the Batik industry in, of the future. And thank you, Nate, because I think we picked the best moderator here. You led a very oh. engaging discussion <laughs> and really once again, thank you so much. So we'll say bye to the moderator and the panelists for now. Um, as for the rest of our audience, as, okay, you want to say wave, wave bye, and then you can turn off. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank as for you. our audience, bye. thank you, honey. As for our audience, uh, I just want to thank you for your time and attention and spending Fashion Revolution Week with us. Uh, I just want to uh, pop over to a consumer behavior su survey that we're conducting for the Malaysian public. Um, this is one that we're conducting uh, for the next month, and I would really like to invite all of you to be a part of it because we have limited local data on consumer sentiment around the sustainability of fashion, and we've relied mostly on anecdotes or Western-focused studies. So we aim to address the misconception that the growing concern amongst consumers in sustainability is a Western concept, with a report specific to a Malaysian data set supporting a Southeast Asian study conducted by Fashion Revolution Singapore and Oxford Development Consultancy. And then also to remind everyone that Earth Week is not over because we have lots happening with Think City and Friends of Bukit Kara. Next up tonight, we have a documentary screening called May, uh, The Clothes We Wear. So we live in an age of hyper-consumption and nowhere is this more obvious than the fashion industry. However, in recent years, it's become trendy for clothing labels to tout green credentials, advertising eco-friendly labels, allegedly made according to strict environmental standard. But is it all genuine? or is it just greenwashing? And tonight we'll dive deeper into the discussion. We also have our next event closing off, um, uh, sorry, we also have our next event with Friends of Bukit Kara tonight as part of Think City's Earth Week campaign, Firefly Biodiversity, Mysteries and Ecology. Did you know fireflies can be found in urban forests? Inland fireflies are numerous in shape, size, and light display patterns reflecting their higher biodiversity and unique relationships with our forests. Friends of Bukit Kara's Magical Mysteries at Bukit Kara Project will share a lot of fascinating insights that most of us won't know. Uh, we'd love for you to, to join us uh, tomorrow as well. And last but not least, we have we are closing off Fashion Revolution Week with a clothes swap tomorrow with Raffles Kuala Lumpur. All of you are welcome to join us. You don't have to be a student. Uh, they also have a renewal corner where you'll be able to get your items fixed or tailored or 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 uh, what do you call that? Um, altered. Um, so this will be a really useful resource for anyone who is looking to refresh their fashion in an eco-friendly way. And as part of Think City Institute's Earth Week 2021 campaign, uh, again, we would like to remind you that the 
Earth Week is not over. We still have a lot of really interesting insights to share for the rest of the week, thanks to Think City Institute and Friends of Bukit Kera. And again, the itinerary a calendar is just in the chat box below, so check that out over there. And as part of Think City Institute's Earth Week 2021 campaign, as a huge thank you for your participation, attendees will be receiving a 30% discount voucher for the Habitat Penang Hill, made possible by the Habitat Penang Hill and Habitat Foundation. The Habitat Penang Hill is the iconic rainforest park set alongside the ancient rainforest atop Penang Hill. Enjoy breathtaking views of the island while supporting the work of the Habitat Foundation, which is working to safeguard nature in Malaysia and beyond. And while we know that, you know, currently interstate travel restrictions are still in place, I'm sure once they lift, uh, every one of us will be raring to go, ready to travel, um, to discover more of the wonders of Malaysia. So be our guest, enjoy a 30% discount on entrance. For now, we will say good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you tonight and tomorrow um, while we leave you with this video to give you a little taste of what you can look forward to at the Habitat tonight.